You are listening to the Logbook Project podcast, and we appreciate you tuning in. The Logbook Project is a global journey of a World War II pilot's logbook, collecting first-hand accounts of veterans, witnesses, and victims from all sides of this horrific conflict. The project is intended as a token of remembrance and education to raise awareness of the sacrifices made. We encourage you to learn more about our project at our website, thelogbookproject.com. Welcome to this episode of the Logbook Project Podcast. My name is Lars McKee, talking to you from a cold, damp, miserable Sweden. And as always, from his warm, tropical paradise of St. Lucia, the project founder, Nick DeVo. How are you doing this afternoon, Nick? I am good, Lars. How are you? Well, I guess you're cold, but I'm good. <laughs> good to be here and, and very, very excited to have our first guest. But before we get into that, just a few words of encouragement to get you to tune in to our first introductory episode where we explain more about what we do, why we do it, and how we go about it. On today's episode, we will talk about pilot officer Winfred Sidney Knox, an RAF pilot from Telemat, who ended up piloting a horse glider into Germany during Operation Varsity. And I've been looking forward to making this episode quite much because this is actually the first time we have a guest on our podcast. So it's our distinct honor and pleasure to say hello and welcome to Mr. Peter Knox. How are you doing, Peter? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great to have you here. So, Peter, you're, you're talking to us from uh, your own tropical paradise of Trinidad, right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, our quick-thinking listeners will immediately have recognized that uh, you share the same surname as our uh, subject veteran today. Perhaps you should clarify what your relation to Mr. Wilfred Sidney Knox is. I am his third child. He had five children, three girls, two boys, and I'm the third child. Your dads took a very similar journey through Canada. Both joined up during 1943 uh, to go through the BCATP, which is the British Commonwealth Air Training Program, to become a pilot, to join the war effort. So I'm not going to go into too much detail in terms of that, but I believe your dad, Nick, he went through in Alberta and uh, Mr. Knox went through in Ontario. He completed about two months prior to your dad, Nick. Peter, do you know when your father left Trinidad to go? No. No. We would probably be able to work that out. I, I, know, he, um, I know he trained in St. Catharines. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's right by Niagara Falls. And my son went to university yes. there, university there called Brock. And when I was put them in, put them in university, there was, there's a museum with all the persons that trained there. And his name was there. Well, in nice. the huh. Museum, yeah. Very cool. That's nice. So how, how much do you know your father's service in the war? Did he Very ever little. talk about it or he, no. was he just like, no? Never spoke about it. No. Oh. That's a very common theme within the project, right, Nick? It's like yeah. your, your own father never spoke about it either. Typical, very typical. Yeah. But did you get the sense that, you know, if you asked him, he would talk about it or he did not wish to speak of it? He, no, he, he did not wish to speak about it. But when he had grandchildren and they started asking him, he was more open about it. He was a lot older then and he was more open, I guess. I don't... I, I'm not sure why. Yes, that, that is also a very common theme with many of these gentlemen, many of the veterans. They will open up to the next generation, to the two generations down, but not the immediate one out. Yeah. What we can do today is add a little bit of context and maybe a bit of color to your father's uh, wartime service, since uh, Peter has been very kind to share a digital version of his father's logbook with us and also some excerpts from his. Uh, from his book or from his memoirs. So when it comes to researching anything, it's, you know, it's just fr small fragments of information that you can start piecing together. And let's say that we have some experience scrutinizing logbooks from the war by this time. So I'm not going to go through too much of the time he spent in Canada, other than saying that he graduated in August of 1944, earning his pilot wings. At that point, he was basically a qualified pilot. And went over to the UK. And I think this is probably where you also know quite a bit about Peter. He went over to UK and ended up uh, piloting a horse a glider into a combat zone in Germany in Operation Varsity. Yeah. And that, that's probably what you have as well, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I, well, I know you trained on the uh, hurricane. And oh. you, you was waiting to go into combat. And then this, well, he said this guy, this officer came in the mess one day and asked for, for volunteers. He didn't know what it was for and he volunteered. You know, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's about it. Yeah. I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit because, uh, I, I've looked into that a little bit more and if it's an air marshal that came in to looking for volunteers to transition, to become a glider pilot. Obviously at that time it wasn't disclosing for what for or anything, but they were recruiting out of the REF pool of uh, pilots. So this must've been somewhere in October, November timeframe of 1944, because your dad, starts to making his transition to uh, glider pilots in early December of 1944, and then ends up in March of 1945 to fly into varsity. So what he ended up doing was becoming a member of the glider pilot regiment. And the glider pilot regiment was formed up in 1942, and it was under the British Army Air Corps, and their responsibility was to crew the British Army's gliders in airborne operations, right? So the GPR or the glider pilot regiment, they pretty much drew their own recruits out of the regular army units. It was all on a volunteer basis. And the recruit was then put through some military and REF air crew uh, selection process. And when they were deemed as an acceptable recruit, they were then put through some rigorous training to be a glider pilot. But they were also put through some infantry training to become what they were termed as a total soldier. Now, the total soldier concept was basically, the thing was, at least in the British units, uh, I don't know exactly how it worked on the U.S. side, but in the British side, the lighter pilots, they were expected to pick up arms and participate in combat alongside the soldiers that they carried into battle. So all glider pilots were really taught on all the weapon systems and all the equipment that they could carry into battle, then obviously to fight alongside the soldiers that they carried in there. So these were pretty, I, I'd say that they were probably more infantrymen made into glider pilots rather than pilots made into infantrymen. So this is also interesting now to see the recruitment of your father. In his memoirs, he explained how this air marshal comes in asking for recruits and an air marshal was a very high ranking REF officer, comes in asking for recruits and your father, he says he was just tired of sitting around doing nothing. So he volunteered. Now, it's kind of important to understand now also why this air marshal was there to recruit. This was because of Operation Market Garden, the high risk, high reward gamble to get across the Rhine to establish a bridgehead into Germany to push on towards Berlin, of course. It didn't pay off, it failed. And zooming in, I'm not going to enter into too much detail. I'm just going to look at the glider pilot regiment. So what happened was that the glider pilot regiment, they landed around Arnhem. And the Battle of Arnhem, the glider pilot regiment sustained over 90% casualties, 90%. Either in killed, wounded, or captured. So I won't say that the glider pilot was wiped out because they had a lot of pilots still, you know, back in the UK, but 90% of what they actually fielded in Operation Market Garden, they lost. So this is really why they were now out. If they're going to have any chance to do any more operations in airborne landings, they needed to recruit new pilots. And obviously the REF at that time had a lot of pilots sitting around doing nothing because the air war in Europe towards the end of 1944, it wasn't the meat grinder it used to be. So they had a lot of pilots sitting around being available. And that's why they were out there recruiting, asking for volunteers to transition to gliders. And that's what your father ended up doing. Um, I'm sure he would have understood and heard the stories of the survivability of a, a glider pilot at the time of recruiting. As far as I know, he, he did not know he was being recruited for gliders at the time. All right. He did not know what he was being recruited for. They never, they never said, they never said it was gliders. He learned that after. So, yeah. So Peter, at the point where he did understand what it was he was signed up for, I mean, did he 
I don't know. Was there any recourse? Could he could he say, well, hello, I didn't know, or I mean, did he ever express? Oh no, 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 no. He um he said he quite enjoyed the training, the glider training. He said it was very primitive, the cockpit. He tried to explain to me there was an instrument that he had to follow to stay in a certain Level. and he was being towed. When he was being they were being towed, were, he said it was a very primitive string, a string and something that he had to keep in his yeah. center of the instrument right. to say in the right spot on it too. Um, right. He right. said, he said, but he enjoyed the glider, um, glider training. Um, and, um, I could. and he knew, he knew the fatality rate was high. He knew that. And he yeah. said that, um, the, I don't know if it was a sergeant, whoever was in charge of the troops on board, they made a deal in advance that if, if he got them safely to the landing zone, he would look after him. The sergeant, I think it's a sergeant, would look, look after him. Right. You know? So that's, that deal was made in advance. I, I, I don't know. That's what he said. Because I, I, don't think he ever shot, he... I don't think he ever shot a gun, really. I mean, he, he wasn't interested in shooting anybody. There's actually a funny, well, funny in the sense of it, but I can see in his logbook, I believe it was the 14th of February, 1945, in, in one of the training missions, uh, I believe it's the uh, training for on Hamel cars. I can't remember now. But anyway, the funny thing was that he was the first pilot and his second pilot or the co-pilot was a Sergeant Knox. So you had a pilot officer Knox in the left seat and then you had a Sergeant Knox in the right seat. I found that oh. funny because both of them were actually named Sydney. So that must have been a kind of a humoristic day. It was just training. And I have not been able to establish the other Sydney Knox, but I, I believe that Miss might actually be one of the Arnhem uh, survivors because there is a Sydney Knox that landed, participated in the Battle of Arnhem, but then managed to swim the Rhine back into Allied country and, and survive that way. So it could be him. I don't know, but it, it looks so. But that kind of knocks you out. Yeah. I so, didn't know that. Yeah. I know you spoke about his co-pilot quite a bit um, over the years. I think it was uh, so Sergeant Fruin, Fruin, something. Yeah, Fruin. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure whatever happened to him. I tried to look and I can't trace him. I can't find him anywhere, but they, they flew quite a bit together during the training. So they must have been kind of teaming up early and then making a team, a pilot and co-pilot team out of them because... They flew quite a bit during the training and all the buildup and then also in the Operation Varsity. And yeah, they're, they're your father also speaks of him in his memoirs. Uh, yeah. But I'm not sure. He, I think he died soon after the war or something. I'm not sure because mm -hmm. well, I never heard about him again. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try and, and dig something up. Would be interesting. I, that's, I love doing these things. <laughs> Understatement yeah. of the year. Lance, how many <laughs> hours did Mr. Knox train in gliders? Uh, you train? know what? I don't know. He has over 300 hours total. I believe he came to the UK with about, I have to look. I don't know, actually. Yeah. But he, he went through quite a bit. I mean, he started with a glider training school in, in 1st of December on Hotspurs 2s. Then he proceeded to the 23 HGCU, which was Heavy Glider Conversion Unit, the 13th of uh, December. So he was flying gliders quite a bit prior to Operation Varsity. Yeah, I was surprised when I saw it read the logbook, how much um, flying he did. Yeah. I thought it was a quick, I thought it was a quick conversion, yeah. but clearly I was mistaken. I think they said it was a, should have been a six week conversion, something like that, but he certainly flew. I mean, the conversion itself to gliders in order to operate it, that's probably, I mean, for a qualified pilot, it shouldn't take that long, to be honest. It's, uh, as a pilot, you, you would have done numerous dead stick landings, which is basically a power off landing in your normal airplane. So gliding would not, not have been something strange or new to them. So, but then again, piloting a glider loaded with soldiers and jeeps and stuff, that, that's probably another thing. I have a lot of uncles. My father's brothers and all their cousins were in the war. 
most of them were pilots. Quite two of them was quite highly decorated. And one was a squadron leader on the um, Lancasters. Did many, many missions, many. And he survived. And my other uncle was Ferdinand that Farquhar. An uncle of yours. <laughs> these, are, these are my uncles, yeah. Ferdinand Farquhar, he was a Spitfire squadron leader. He was actually shot down behind enemy lines in um, Sicily. And then he made it back to Malta. And then he, <laughs> then he got shot down again. But he had many, many kills in Spitfires. Did you know this, Nick? Yes, I did. I did know <laughs> that. Uh, there was one gentleman who died within the last two years. Um, as, as one. As one. He was with Lancaster. He wrote a book um, on it. Right. He actually had a, 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 wrote a diary in, during the entire war. And he wrote a book oh. on it. But he, he had many, many missions. Yeah, I don't want to sidetrack this. No, 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 But he, I have his book and I, I knew him well. He used to, he used to speak about the war. In fact, both of them spoke about the war. Yeah. And both of them became commercial pilots after the war. Really? My father also was waiting to become a commercial pilot. And, they, um, and eventually he went into business, which was probably the better thing for him. Yes. But the, my For other sure. two uncles were commercial pilots their entire life. But Esman, apparently, I mean, he had numerous missions there. And he bombed a village in France, which turned out to be the wrong village. And he killed a lot of people, innocent people. Mm -hmm. And he went to the village after the war, many years after, like 10, 20 years off, And um, apologized to all the families that he had uh, killed. <laughs> yeah. He actually paid them comp compensation for the damage he had done. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, Crazy. talk about an attempt to rec reconcile. I mean, to, to do that is, that must have been haunting. I mean, for 20 years and then to go do that, that's, yeah, that's a strong mind to do that. A very courageous thing to do. Yeah. And then the other one who was, I think the, even the, the, the better pilot. He was a fighter pilot, was a Ferdinand. Yeah. I'm actually a pilot. They taught me to fly. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That was fascinating, man. Yeah. Real history, yeah. That's they, um, awesome. for the, both of them, even when they retired from commercial, being commercial pilots, they had their own airplanes also they, to fly for fun. They were actually also successful businessmen. And, um, Ferdinand had a flying school and he taught many, many people to fly. That's cool nice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still fly? No, I'm retired. I'm retired. I still, I still fly for fun, but not, I'm, I'm a retired pilot. I don't realize what that's a hell of a legacy you come from then. Wow. I, I, I have many, um, many uncles that, that were pilots anyway. Quite a few didn't survive. My father had a, bro had a brother that didn't survive. That seems to be a very common theme out of the, the Caribbean with your young men joining the REF. At some point, we need to do some mathematics or to try and figure out how many, in terms of numbers, work out a percentage. Because I believe it was a very high percentage of, of a headcount contribution from a percentage point of view. Oh, yeah, a lot of them. There are, there are a lot of... Um... They, they made a big contribution. I could actually send you one of his books if you want. Um, you might be Would interested in reading it. Yeah. And it's, it's really only about the war, his book. Okay. They, they spoke a lot about the war, those, my, those two uncles, which was unusual. Well, well they had a lot and, to speak and, about. Yeah. So I guess you understand now, Peter. I did not realize just how dangerous all this training was. And so for your father... To, to do all of that glider training as long as he did. And as you say, it was very primitive. Um, I just have a whole new respect for what these men did. You know, even with, without the combat, just, just to survive and get through all of it was... Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm and, still in and, awe of it, really. And that was just the flying part of it. Mr. Knox, 
participated in some heavy, <laughs> heavy combat on the ground in Germany too. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've looked at that a little bit closer and he mentions it in his memoirs or in his book, but I don't think he's fully recounting <laughs> the severity of the combat that was actually taking place. Operation Varsity, this was a very large airborne landing. It was about 17,000 men out of two divisions. It was the 17th Airborne Division, which was the Americans, and then was the 6th Airborne Division, which was the British. Uh, I can't go through the whole thing in Operation Varsity, but zooming in now to look at what, you know, in relation to your dad, Peter, he was posted to F Squadron Glider Pilot Regiment. F Squadron took and flew elements out of the uh, 1st Battalion Royal Ulster Rifles into combat. And I know this because of Mr. Knox's memoirs, where he says that he flew a horse glider with a jeep and six soldiers from an Irish regiment called the Royal Ulster Rifles. Now. That is just data and just small fragments of information that we now can take and then you can start expanding and putting into the greater context and adding some color to it. So the Royal Ulster Rifle, they had three objectives. They were to land and seize a bridge over the River Issel, southeast of uh, the town of Hamilton, which was on the east side of uh, Rhine. This was now in, in German uh, territory. The second objective was to seize the train station area and a uh, level crossing close by, which was also a major tank obstacle if it had been blown up. Those two objectives were going to be achieved by a coup de main uh, out of two companies from the Royal Astor Rifles. They were to land close to the objectives and then go and, and seize, seize them. The third objective they had, which is where your father comes in, Peter. They were supposed to land south of Hamilton uh, and then start to uh, move towards the two objectives to reinforce them and also to form a defensive perimeter to stop any German counterattacks uh, coming from the southeast to kind of recapture or destroy the bridges, which was really the key of the whole thing. So what I've been able to find out is that Given the fact that your father carried a jeep and six soldiers, I believe is part of the third group, the, the third objective, which is to land south of Hamilton. And in doing so, I've narrowed it down to, I think I know now, he piloted one of the 28 horses uh, that was participating in that. And I probably have even narrowed it down even the further to one of the 15. But... Uh, I'll try and see if I can actually find out the number, which horse glider he piloted and where it landed, because all that is actually out there in terms of details to, to see. The bridge that they were supposed to see, it's still there. But anyway, they landed and there were quite a lot of anti-aircraft going on from the Germans that were actually hitting quite a lot of the gliders as they were coming into land. The area that they were landing on was also obscured by a lot of haze and smoke. So that contributed to some of the, the issues that they had in landing. Now, what they didn't know was that the area where they were landing, there were about 150 German troops billeted in the, in the buildings close by. So immediately as they were coming in, they were, were taking under fire. Immediately as they landed, they were fired upon as well, which basically your father also alludes to in his memoirs, that he was under fire immediately after landing. So anyway, the Royal Astor Rifles, they achieve their two objectives and the third, and then they defend this bridge for a couple of days, really. And where your father and his Sergeant Fruin is actually participating in that, being armed with a, I think a Piat, a anti-tank weapon, um, to shoot tanks if they were coming in, which they did. There were actually two German tanks that tried to storm one of the bridges there uh, that he was defending, but it was shot. Don't know exactly what his role in that was, but the glider pilot regiment pilots then withdrew and actually started to walk backwards to go back to England, which they did on the 30th of March. So they spent six days on the ground in Germany before they withdrew and flew back to the UK. So it's that. I don't know whether he even ever recounted anything of this uh, to you, Peter, or no? No. No. Hmm. Nothing at all. 
English. It was more, probably more battle, more combat than, than he would have liked to see. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he, because they asked him to, I think they asked him to go back again after he got back to the UK and he, he declined. <laughs> Smart man. Um, do we know what the casualty rate was from the operation for the glider pilot? In Operation Varsity, glider pilot had about a 60% casualty rate. It was, it was fairly high. There's, there's something, a bell ringing me in that 44 out of a hundred pilots. I think 60%, so, yeah, I, I, I read that, I yeah. think. Casualty rate, somewhere around there. Besides your father's logbook, did he save anything else from, from the war? We have any medals and I don't know what you call it. He had, you know, he, got, he had a German Luger, which he said he got from Operation Varsity. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he gave it up to the, the police many, must have been 15 years ago. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. My father was a, a strange guy because he, um, my, mo my mother was half German. He married a German. <laughs> wow. strange. Yeah. My mother's father was German. He was a doctor. Yeah. And he came to Trinidad just before the war. And during the war, he was actually in charge of the uh, Imperial Hospital. And um, during the war, they, they interned him. But they still allowed him to run the hospital. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then my, my, uh, well, then he married my mother's mother, you know, who was half French or something. Mixed up. Yeah. But my mother hated Germans. Yeah. She always hated said, German. I, yeah, I used to say, but why you hate German? She said, well, because they started two world wars. How can I like people like that? You know? And, but it's strange that my father would marry, you know, half, a half German person. Well, you know, the little I know of your father, like you say, he just pioneered his own course. Um, so. For me, that doesn't come as a surprise somehow. It just doesn't. <laughs> yeah. You know. So, Nick, one thing that we haven't covered, how did you get Mr. Knox's signature? We've not even touched that yet. I'd love to hear so, that story. <laughs> I, well, I mean, okay, so Lars may not know this, but Sidney Knox is, is, a, is a towering figure in the commercial landscape, not just in Trinidad, but throughout the Caribbean. Um, so it is a, it's a, a name that you just grew up, you know, hearing about. And I'm trying to think now, how did I come to understand that he was a veteran? I, my, my father-in-law has actually had a lot of respect for him, Hollis Bristol, and, and met your dad on a few occasions. Um, and I think may have had his book. And then um, I got to read it and I read the excerpt about the glider pilot and so on. But I, I'm not quite sure how, I mean, I do know, Lars, that as soon as I, go, after getting the book back from England, so I had all of two signatures in it, I was mm -hmm. then detailed to look around the Caribbean and see, well, because I, I did know that, you know, there were several pilots who had gone up from Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, um, and even one or two from here in St. Lucia. So I was determined then to, at that point, start looking and trying to find somebody. And I guess... Yeah, and then at the time too, it's funny. I had attended um, Arthur. There's a school called the Arthur Lockjack School, of which your dad is was uh, what do you call those thing? Um, he was one of the principals involved anyway. He, his name is closely associated with it, right? So, I I made contact through through them really. I, a lady there, um, very kindly made the connection for me, and then the book was delivered to him. And just like the, Mr. Maury, he just signed it. No fanfare, nothing. I mean, he just signed his name very small and sent it back, you know, and that was that. Um, and so he was the third or fourth signature. But just to have somebody from the Caribbean who had def, who had gone in and done a mission was something, you know, I just, I wanted that. But, and I tried, I, I came, and at some point I did come down to, back to Trinidad to visit. Um, and I called your dad. To, I was hoping just to come and sit and chat with him, but your brother was visiting from Grenada. So at the last minute, he, he said, you know, he couldn't see me and so on. But he was always very kind when we spoke on the phone. Not any long conversation, but he always seemed happy to, enough to talk to me. But we didn't get into any. This, my, 
our, you know, our dads certainly never connected while they were over there. Um, and so they didn't, they just ran very parallel courses through Canada and then into England, like you say. And my father, the one story he told me, and that was, this was the only story was that, yes, they were also looking for volunteers for this glider mission. And he declined. He was smart enough to decline because honestly, I think it just took a special human being to get into that glider and do what your dad did. It was, and the same thing too, he said, then after we landed, we had to find our own way back. And that didn't interest him. That, that would be yeah. the story. Yeah. Of, you know, you do all of that and then they tell you, well, all right, you're on your own. He didn't like that at all. Um, so he was like, nah. Yeah. But I mean, I just think what your dad did was just, it blows my mind. When, when, when I read about, you know, trying to control these flying coffins and training and then landing in an active battlefield. I, I mean, I know it's just one mission, but boy, Peter, it, I mean, you know, you'd have to have another, the, the, the co-pilot seat should be empty just for the size of the cojones you need to pull that off. Sorry. I yeah. Take some real. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but he, um, um, he was a, my, my father and his cousins were a big, big people, tall, big humans. And, um, they all liked to drink beers and my father didn't drink that much. He had stopped drinking when, after the war, he, he stopped drinking. He never drank alcohol again, but my two uncles always, they could drink four or five beers in half an hour. And the funny thing is during the war, they never drank any alcohol at all until the war was over. <laughs> No, so it's to, funny you say that. One, one of the things I understood was that the, the manufacturers at VAT 19 would send bottles of rum yes. to them every so they often. Would, they would send cases of rum once a month for the West Indian right. in, in the UK. Yeah. And, well, you, you have to wonder how much of that actually found the intended recipient, but also they probably would use it to barter for cigarettes and things. What, yes, the, yes. Yeah, but it, it used to go to a particular pub. In, in his book, he, they talk about the, this lady that owned this pub that all the West Indians used to, when it, whenever they had time off, they used to go there and they used to stay upstairs. Upstairs had rooms and they would live there for the four or five days they were off. But all the alcohol from Angostura would be sent there. And they, they all speak of this lady highly, um, that she did a lot for them, you know. So, and, and I also read a story about somebody falling out of a window who is dead. Yes. Yes. It's because it's, um, a friend of his, yeah. <laughs> that that, yeah. that seems to have traumatized him quite a bit. Of course it would. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, a freak, a freak accident. Yeah. And then he had to, he had to tell the, the mother or the father what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was rough. Yes. So, uh, Peter, do you know if your dad, after he got his wings, to probably, what you said, Lars, around August? 44? August 44, yes. Yeah. Did, do you know, Peter, if he came to Trinidad before then deploying over to the No. Europe? No, he went straight from Canada. He went straight. Yeah. Because, because my dad definitely came to St. Lucia after getting his wings, and he got his wings in October. And then, and that's a big part of his journey that we are missing is, how long then did it take to, for him to arrive back in England? Right. Um, yeah. But, and, and like Lars said, that made a huge difference in terms of, you know, how close or far you, you stayed from combat. But by then there was definitely a glut of pilots. And like your dad talks about just being bored. So um, again, you know, it's fascinating. It's, it's so, the margins of who lived and who died were so thin. Um, and the difference of a couple Your of luck. weeks. It really, are you, I, I looked at, um, I started looking at the Masters of the Air series last night. Have you seen that? No, a fr funny you, you brought it up. A friend of mine told me about it yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. Um, I think, I think Saving Private Ryan is probably more, more intense, at least so far. I've, I watched two episodes, but, um, but you know, it's certainly, like you said, the 43 was really, that when they started these daylight raids, they were really getting crucified in the beginning. So, yeah. um, it's a lot to see in the rest. But yes, 
Peter, do you you must know the Hammersmiths? Um, do you yes. know the Marys? Yes. Yeah. So so again. Well, I know um, David David Mary. Right. Okay. So David. <laughs> David and Stephen. I think their dad was in the war too. Yes. But not as a pilot. Well, they lost an uncle. Um, Desmond, was it? What was his name, Lars? Yes, I think Desmond, yeah. Right, there were two of them. And Lars Sasa asked me about who is this Mary person from Trinidad. And I, you know, I was being very clueless at first. And then I started to think, hang on, one of my nephews is married to a Hamelsmith. And her sister is married to a Mary. Um, and it turned out then that one of the Marys was training in a, not too far from where my father was and went, his plane went down in a, in, because of some heavy smoke one night. And so all the planes from the training schools in the nearby area was, was spent several days looking for this lost plane, which they eventually found. But it that was, was last, in Canada. Yes. Yes. And so it was, but it was last. As we pointed out this out in my father's logbook, because all of a sudden he, there was three consecutive days of of suit of yeah. Was it last basically? Yeah, he he recorded them as a standard search, which just stood out. Yeah. Three flights stood out from everything else that he was doing. So I started to look in some of the diaries for the the specific air station or the aerodromes, just you know, the operation diaries to see what was going on. And obviously it was part of uh, a search for a missing uh, airspeed Oxford plane from another school nearby, number th 36 Pennell. Um, and, um, well, what it turned out is that obviously during a night training navigation exercise, and there was a some big, there were always big bushfires or, or wildfires or in the area. But what happened this time is that during the night, the uh, the wind changed, so it blew all the smoke towards the aerodrome. So Mary, David Mary, was the instructor, and his pupil, George Conway, they took off just shortly before midnight on the 4th of May, 1944. And just as they took off, they were taking off with their backs to, and you'll understand this one being a pilot, Peter, they were taking off in the runway direction uh basically then turning around and then meeting the smoke. So they went from VMC to IMC in a matter of seconds. And it was basically from, from ground ground up. So obviously they tried to turn back, they believe. There's there's accounts of actually another pilot that was just returning with his pupil to that aerodrome that almost had a head on collision with another plane in the smoke trying to to get down. He made the smart choice, that pilot, and diverted and flew about 40 miles south of this thing and then just sort of made a forced landing in a field. This other plane, which was most likely containing David Mary and George Conway, they just disappeared. They weren't found again until five days later or something. They were actually found just a couple of miles south of the aerodrome in a school of poplar trees and it was just burnt out wreck. You know, lads even got them to go and make a little um a little memorial to the guy and it was uh -huh. quite amazing. Yeah, he did all of that. And he had a flyover. Some guys from the neighbor from the area and they flight the flight club and they flew, they did the missing man formation. We have it all on oh. videos. It was quite remarkable. Johnny Mary is the one who's married to the Hammer Smith girl. Yeah. So but anyway, so, well, look, I really, you know, I don't want to keep you too much longer. I, I really appreciate you making the time to speak with us this afternoon. It's been great. Yeah. Um, okay. And, uh, yeah, but really, really appreciate it, Peter. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Nice meeting you, Lars. Nice meeting you too, Peter. And thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, thank you. The next episode, we will be talking about Mr. Benjamin Ferenc and uh, Bill Campbell. Bill Campbell. Uh, yes. So until then. All right. Thanks Thank you. Thank Enjoy. you. Bye. Bye. You have just listened to an episode of the Logbook Project podcast, a non-profit initiative seeking to illuminate and preserve some of the veteran legacies of World War II. To contact us or obtain more information about our project, please visit our website, thelogbookproject.com. We would love to hear from you, and thank you for listening. <laughs>